afternoon. As you know from your programs, our doctors Herman Schwann of the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Leon Kaufman of the University of California in San Francisco, and I now give you Dr. Schwann. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, may I have the first slide, please? Oh. A title of my lecture and four topics I want to present to you. First, emergence. Biomedical engineering, biophysics, and medical physics emerged almost simultaneously. Early beginnings date about 40 or 50 years back and occurred at a variety of different places and in different countries. At the time, no real differences were apparent between the three disciplines. I repeat, the disciplines are biomedical engineering, biophysics, and medical physics. And after a period of differentiation separation to follow, we witness today again much cross-fertilization. No formal training was available originally, and motivation to enter these interdisciplinary fields varied from case to case and frequently demanded optimism with regard to an uncertain future, uncertain recognition, and little financial reward. I myself entered this field with great skepticism. Biology appeared so extremely complex, and it seemed almost hopeless to apply the scientific approach of the engineer and of the physicist to life systems. At that time, the sensational potential of X-rays to visualize anatomical structure in the life body had been well established already. However, little was known about the hazardous effects of such radiations and their continued great activity in advancing X-ray technology, diagnosis, and eventually therapy. Little had been done to search for additional applications of physical forms of energy in medicine and biology, and to systematically study the properties of life matter which govern the propagation of other modes of energy through it. Early laboratories in this field developed during the 1920s. The total number was small, and I do not know of any academic programs leading to advanced degrees. In most of these early institutions, engineers joined with physicists and medical doctors, attracted by the possibility to apply the analytical power of the physical sciences and its instrumentation to problems in biology and medicine. Already at that time, there was a good mixture of fundamental and applied research. The more basically oriented work was in most cases undertaken to eventually solve problems of a practical importance. I call it purpose-oriented basic research. And early research was concerned with the effects of ionizing radiation, X-ray technology, electrophysiology, studies of the electrical properties of life matter and relevant applications in physical medicine. After the Second World War, it became apparent that rapidly developing electronics should be able to offer much to medical practice and biological research. Interest began to focus on medical applications and the term medical electronics was coined. The relevance of engineering to biological research and medical applications became very obvious now. And today, the term biomedical engineering stands for the application of engineering concepts and analytical tools and instrumentation 
to problems in medicine and biology. In this emerging climate, biomedical engineering emerged eventually very rapidly. To give some figures, in the early 1950s, the so-called Annual Conference of Engineering, Medicine, and Biology we attended by about 100 people listening to some 20 to 30 papers. Today, members of relevant societies number close to or in excess of 20,000 attending more than 100 meetings a year where thousands of papers are presented annually. It was the Institute of Radio Engineers and the American Institute for Electrical Engineering which established administrative committees first, interest in fostering engineering medicine and biology. And they formed together with the Instrument Society of America a committee to organize the annual conference for engineering in medicine and biology which continue to this day to be a focal point and focal event. During the late 1950s, the National Institute of Health became increasingly supportive of biomedical engineering activities and established a large program for higher education and research in the field. The first programs to receive federal funds for training leading to a PhD in bioengineering were allocated to the universities of Pennsylvania, Rochester, Johns Hopkins, a few others. And in about 1960, the first departmental and doctoral programs were established here at the University of Pennsylvania and rapidly elsewhere. May I have the next slide, please? Oh, pardon me. Yep. The present and near future. First, academic and industrial growth. Today, the IEEE Society for Engineering in Medicine Biology alone has more than 5,000 members, and a large fraction of our engineering schools have either departments, programs, or institutes dedicated to these interdisciplinary fields. As a matter of fact, I believe it's almost safe to state that there is virtually no campus, no university in this country where you don't have some biomedical engineering going on. Either there's a department or an institute or at least some laboratories are strongly engaged in the field. The total effort, the total academic effort that is, as measured by student enrollment and number of programs and departments may now approach a plateau. Biomedical engineering has clearly established itself as a productive and important academic discipline. However, much additional relevant work is also carried out increasingly in many other departments, medical departments such as radiology, biophysics, medicine, physiology, and many other traditional engineering departments. Industrial activities, as reflected by biomedical technology, continue to increase very rapidly likewise. In a recent survey of some 17 EE specialties, which was conducted by the IEEE Spectrum, the field of biomedical engineering was judged to be the third most promising career path in 17, only surpassed by computer software and communications. Under 17 EE specialties, it was list number three. Another recent survey concludes that healthcare service and equipment companies are among the fastest growing in the United States. It concludes also that out of 100 publicly owned companies judged to be pay setters, 24 are healthcare or medical equipment suppliers. It is the largest single category ahead of the 21 in the companies in the computer and related product categories. Of course, any precise prediction of the future of this market is very difficult to state. The market, while rapidly growing, is far from settled. 
almost continuously new potential applications of modern engineering advance to medicine and biology appear on the horizon. Many of them no doubt run to difficulties. Others emerge with promise and potential impact which is often initially entirely unpredictable. There is no doubt that increasing medical demand and public interest will assure rapid continued growth of the medical technology market. Scientific meetings, journals, specialties, Biomedical engineering research at universities, industrial medical technology in the academic educational effort at universities are reflected by the rapidly growing number of professional meetings in the field. For a number of years, it has become now impossible to attend all of them in order to obtain a full concept of ongoing activities. I estimate the total number of meetings per year on the order of some hundred, representing more than 20 different interdisciplinary societies in the field, but with primary interest in the bioengineering or biophysical area, or some of its sub-disciplines, with a total membership, as stated before, well ahead of 20,000. The number of journals devoted to the field and its subdisciplines is also growing very rapidly. The rapid growth in presentations and published papers is indicative of an unusual growth rate of the field, complementing the one in medical technology summarized just a few minutes ago. You might say biomedical engineering activities and growth reflects its what I call two dimensional character. In one dimension, we may subdivide the biomedical field into n subdisciplines, the biomedical field into n subdisciplines, in the other we list m specialties in the engineering fields, a two-dimensional array list in one, all the specialties you can imagine, in the biological and medical fields, in the other, all the specialties in the engineering fields. Now almost all combinations then in this two-dimensional matrix establish potential fields of biomedical engineering activities. Initially, only a rather small fraction of this matrix was activated. The number is now much larger as reflected by the increasing specializations indicated by the growing number of societies and journals. Yet many spaces are still inactive in the matrix, in part due to being without present promise or being clearly without sense, and in part to be filled in time provided the proper stimulus becomes effective. Will there be any saturation to this process in time? I do not believe so unless there will be in the supporting engineering and biomedical disciplines. As long as engineering continues to grow, and as long as there is an interest in improving health care and biological insight, biomedical engineering will almost by definition continue to grow and grow. Some words about basic research and technology. To the outsider, the justification of scientific or technological activities is solely determined by its product, its saleability, and obvious utility. However, we are all aware of the importance of related scientific principles. Unfortunately, there is in most cases a significant time lag between the emergence of scientific principle and technological achievement, and frequently only a fraction of more basically oriented sciences yield practically useful results, which ones unfortunately are difficult to predict. The field of biomedical engineering is no exception. I indicated that during earlier times, much of the more basic work was nevertheless somewhat purpose-related. This is still true 
and may be the reason why a good fraction of the more basic pursuits in the field have been productive from a practical point of view. Yet there are some exceptions. For example, a rather advanced understanding about the mechanism which determines the electric properties of biological cells exists. However, no attempts have been made yet to examine cells with arrays of microscopic electrodes and to create electronic images thereby which reflect various cellular properties depending how frequency and or pulse durations are chosen. Another example is the ultrasonic field. Much is known about the mechanism which is responsible for tissue attenuation, but much less about tissue scattering properties, ultrasonic scattering properties. I submit that research dedicated to improve this insight cannot fail but result in further improvements in medical ultrasonic tissue visualization. Another example is a rapidly emerging field of NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging technology. This field is become a particular important addition to existing medical imaging technologies. But a full understanding of the nature of normal and tissue water and the signals these waters emit as utilized in NMR technologies is still incomplete. With other words, a technology has been developed, but the basic insight at the root of the technology is still not complete. Typically, the National Institute of Health has just recently called for submission of research grant applications to fill this basic gap. Well, many more examples of the sort could be listed to illustrate the need for more purpose-related basic research. Government agencies, such as NIH, frequently expect demonstration of a health-related potential before providing funds for the needed basic research. I submit that this is unwise, even though understandable. Some factors limiting our goals. Another problem contributing to the gap between scientific insight and technological achievement is well known. Universities provide but little incentive and reward for contributions to the translational process from basic principles to product. And industries, particularly in the healthcare field, are reluctant to contribute to this process. Federal funds to contribute to this process are virtually non-existent. I submit that a large program is called for, consisting of three parts. First, a more systematic study of the electrical, acoustic, and mechanical properties of all life matter. Second, a systematic study of the interaction of all sorts of energies, electromagnetic and mechanical, with life matter. And third, a screening of these efforts to select those interactions which appear particularly productive for whatever diagnostic and therapeutic purpose. It is true that much has been accomplished along these lines, but past efforts are entirely incomplete and advancements came frequently almost by accident while undertaking research intended for entirely different purposes. Such an undertaking would also substantially contribute to another field which is rapidly emerging. It is interest in the interaction of whatever energies with life matter it has created increasing concern about related potential health hazards. Not only ionizing radiation, but also broad spectrum of electromagnetic non-ionizing fields are claimed to many to be dangerous. For example, microwaves. You may have read about microwave often slicking microwaves supposed to be dangerous. This interest has had initially little effect on technological progress, 
but this may soon change. Already the installation of many communication facilities has been either delayed or permanently blocked, and the Defense Department's attempts to install low-frequency communication facilities with submarines has been successfully delayed again and again. And, last but not least, construction of high-voltage transmission lines has been impaired or blocked, and I consider it entirely possible that severe restrictions may be imposed on the power emitted by radio and TV stations. These are but a few examples of a rapidly increasing number of limitations imposed on the growth of technology by health considerations. This calls for educated scientific insight about such biological interactions so that in order to combat public fear of the unknown and superficial speculation may be replaced by logical insight and practical, well-founded decisions. Let me just list now a very few examples of the field with comments. I cannot really summarize the total field, so I pick up somewhat arbitrarily just four. First, pacemaker. Perhaps the greatest technological contribution to significantly advanced life expectancy is a cardiac pacemaker. About 500,000 persons in the United States benefit from it, and about the same number in other countries of the world. Originally a rather simple device, it has evolved to a fairly sophisticated yet small device which performs monitoring and diagnostic functions in addition to its primary task of stimulating cardiac tissue. It performs as demanded by the heart, and it appears to have become an ever more sophisticated device able to respond now in the future to varying physiological requirements. Improvements in electro design and battery life expectancy have been substantial and reduced significantly initial replacement needs. Second, imaging technologies. The diagnostic potential of ultrasound is based on its ability to be beamed or focused and to deeply penetrate into tissues. It has been increasingly used since its early introduction during the 1950s. Echocardiography, the ultrasonic examination of heart function, came about during the 1960s, adding to the early electrocardiography a new non-invasive technique which is now universally utilized. Modern advances in X-ray diagnostics are largely due to sophisticated interpretation of signals leading to computerized actual tomography. This great technological diagnostic achievement was appropriately recognized by awarding the Nobel Prize to its chief developers. Interestingly enough, one of the laureates chose to speak about the great potential of emerging NMR technology instead of computerized tomography. Indeed, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging techniques promise yet another, perhaps even greater, potential for diagnosis. And I presume Dr. Kaufman will probably talk about that more. There are several other imaging technologies which have attracted the attention both of engineers and the medical community, including positron emission tomography, ultrasonic tomography, and various other attempts to investigate the merits of other physical signals. In all these cases, the task is how to extract information from the interior about the interior from signals which are registered at the surface of the bounded volume. Mathematical principles which pertain to this problem are well known, have been developed long ago. But at first, with the arrival of modern computers, 
the ability present itself to process the large amount of data needed in some diagnostic image technologies. And the third example which I uh, present to you is a very simple instrument. It's a colder counter. It's based on the fact that biological cells conduct low frequency alternating currents poorly, at least as compared with a typical biological fluid. Cells conduct poorly. This principle is used to rapidly count cells and to measure their individual sizes, somehow electronically. Almost every biological laboratory has one of these machines these days, and it has become a valuable tool in cellar studies. The cold counter has become somewhat more sophisticated with time, but its full potential has not yet been realized. The use of many electrodes, which probe a cell, network analyzers, and or time domain spectroscopy is called for to provide rapid evaluation of cellular size and shape, membrane properties, and cytoplasmic interior. Information of the sort indicated here can be readily extracted by microscopic electronic techniques from the individual cells which are passed rapidly through the probing field. Electronic imaging techniques at the microscopic level appear now entirely feasible with the tools which have become recently available. And last but not least, I mentioned cellular manipulation, as I call it, by electromagnetic fields. It has been known for quite some time that electromagnetic fields impart forces on cells. Alternating fields create all sorts of forces on cells, on bodies in general. These forces in the case of cells may lead to destruction, to fusion, shape changes, rotation, cytoplasmic streaming, and so on. These effects were until recently of interest only as a curiosity, and little research was done to fully understand them. In more recent few years, cell fusion has now become of prime importance in one of the most important fields to affect future health programs. I talk about biotechnology or gene technology, as it is frequently called. This technology is concerned with the transfer and manipulation of genetic information and the electrical cell fusion technique using AC fields has developed as the most promising tool to combine cells and to exchange their genetic content. Further refinements of this technique and in general what I call the electromagnetic manipulation of cells for all sorts of purposes promise to result in entirely new biotechnologies. Well, many more examples could be listed, but the four examples, two chosen to illustrate therapeutic and diagnostic advances, and two to illustrate biotechnologies, may provide an idea of the broad spectrum of opportunity spanning across virtually all medical and biological specialties. The technologies directly related to healthcare, such as pacemakers, artificial organs, limbs and prosthetic devices, will be always of particular interest to the public. But the contribution of electric engineering to biology, such as originally the electron microscope, evolving cell fusion techniques, an application of electrical field theory to the understanding of cellular function and electrical responses are equally important. What price to pay? To me, the potential of biomedical engineering and medical technology is almost unlimited. The application of rapidly growing engineering abilities to biomedical problems, particularly in electrical engineering and the computer field, 
will no doubt result in ever more sophistication productivity. With the tools available and to become available, we can address medical instrumental problems presently only to be dreamt about. It is no longer unrealistic to predict the electrical techniques to become eventually as important to healthcare as chemistry did a long time ago. However, increasing technical sophistications comes only at an increased price. Limitations in individual and federal resources may well place bounds on our ability to reach for the sky. Medicare and individual health expenditures have been more rapidly increasing than any other expenditures of the federal budget. This trend is likely to continue unless mechanisms become effective which limit further expensive sophistication in the interest of more simple and hence cheaper technologies. Usually competition is effective to bring about this about in most technological fields. But competition has so far not been very effective in the healthcare field. These effects have been well recognized. For example, two articles in the first copy of our National Academic New Journal issues in Science and Technology highlights this situation. I quote just a few examples. The total health care cost rose from 6% of the gross national product in 65 to 10.5% in 82, and I anticipate to be 12.3% by 1990. Medicare costs increased from 9.5 billion in 1973 to 57 billion, I repeat, in only 10 years. From 73 to 83, Medicare costs increased from less than 10 billion to almost 60 billion. And while inflation during the past year was only 4%, health care costs still increased in the last year by 12%. Clearly, some steps have to be taken to bring this catastrophic development under control. For example, attempts have been made to formulate the new Medicare's prospective payment system. However, analysis demands that a successful policy of cost contain must address the total health care system, a task which has not been done as yet. Past cost figures indicate that individual and federal expenditures for health may well approach or surpass those for other categories, such as defense, other entitlement programs, and all internal federal projects combined if no limiting factors emerge fast. Now, this raises all sorts of questions. Is it, in the end, not cheaper to spend money for preventive medicine? Should we strive for ever more sophisticated medical technology? Is the healthcare field not slow to become a mixed health technology field? And what should be the future role of the engineer in this field, on healthcare boards and relevant federal agencies? These are problems which are about to become rapidly more important. How they will be solved will greatly influence the growth of biomedical engineering and medical technology in the future. In fact, biomedical engineering and technology should play a key role in alleviating these problems, I believe. Most of engineering is dedicated to the task of improving our lot, to defend our country, to make our life and work easier, to communicate better, to produce cheaper and more efficient energy, to provide better learning and entertainment. But equally important to us is the goal of healthy and joyful living, extending to an increasing older age. I see no limitations to what biomedical engineers might accomplish to achieve these goals. 
if these growth problems, which I just briefly summarized, can be solved, as they surely will be. Thank you. Compared to the speakers uh, that preceded me and that will be following, I feel like the rabbi's driver. For those of you who are not familiar with the law of the pale, it was the 20th anniversary that this driver had been driving this rabbi from town to town. And he mentioned this and said, I have learned so much from being your driver that I feel I could answer the questions you do as well as you do. And the rabbi said, fine, we'll exchange codes. I'll be the driver today. After all, the 20th anniversary only happens once. And they got to the first town, and as it would be, the first question posed to the driver was so complex that they would have taken all of the knowledge accumulated by all of the rabbis that followed, that previous and following to answer. And without missing a beat, the driver said, such a question is so simple, I'll let my driver answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going to be happening. I know that there's been a tremendous increase in the cost of medical care, and that's well documented, but I also know that while I today, I would rather buy a new 1955 Chevy with lap belts and a collapsible steering wheel, but otherwise I'd rather have that than anything else produced by General Motors, I would not like to go into a medical institution that practices 1955 medicine. We're not comparing the same services. So in fact, with all deference to Mr. Lackey, my telephone doesn't work as well as it used to, even before you guys had an excuse. <laughs> we, we are not comparing the same level of service. The technology has changed. And if it's going to be brought under control, there are two ways that this is going to happen. One of them is limiting the access to medical care. And I'm all in favor of that so far as it applies to you guys from this end of the line over there. I don't want to hear it for my family. And the other one, if in a country like ours, this is not going to be acceptable, if we're not going to stand for a two-tier medical system or even a three-tier, what's going to have to happen is that technology will have to come in to make up the difference. It's people that cost the money, it's not the technology. To give you an example, to put a child through 48 hours of penicillin injection, where the most complicated technological procedure is a venous stick, but they wanted 48 hours of, uh, of injection, cost over $2,500 without doctor's fees. A $50,000 machine that can monitor temperature and inject penicillin, where you can send the child home with that, will pay for itself in just one year and be pure gravy from that point on. So technology is the way to both avoid the, the two-tier medical system and to be able uh, to afford it. What I'd like to do is show you a little bit of what's been happening with diagnosis. If we're going to make informed decisions as to what needs to be done to a person, where and when, we need to know what's going on. And if the way of finding out is worse than the cure, or potentially worse than the cure, we're not going to be able to do it, and we're going to be working from an incomplete database. Laparotomy, opening up somebody, is obviously the most accurate and easiest way of finding out what's going on. But there may not be anything wrong, and I don't want to be opened up, just so somebody can satisfy their curiosity. We need ways to look into the human body, and this is what diagnostic imaging has been provided. And I'd like to show you what's been happening, and to a certain degree, the IEEE has been the home of, of the people who have developed this technology before it became so popular that the medical societies picked it up as their own inventions. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? This is, in the 60s, we saw the first truly non-invasive techniques. And I don't call x-rays uh, non-invasive, and not because of the radiation. The problem with x-rays is that in many of the applications, you have to inject hundreds of grams of iodinated materials that are not exactly uh, compatible with the body and its functioning. So x-ray technology tends to be very invasive. One of those was nuclear medicine, and this is a, a, a late nuclear medicine scan, and it doesn't take much to realize 
that, there is, that this is a skeleton and that there is something wrong with this person. There are too many blotches and they are too asymmetrical for, to make this person normal. And what happens is that we're looking at somebody that due to prostatic carcinoma has had metastasis to the skeleton and is basically beyond any treatment. The, the money should be spent in making a person like this comfortable rather than in operating or trying to go after the disease itself. The other technology that came in in the 60s on its own was ultrasound. And ultrasound is a tremendously powerful technology, but to date has a tremendous drawback. It takes competent people to look at the image and understand what it says. As soon as you need that union card, you are going to both decrease the quality of the care. In other words, techniques that require this have a blotchy, if you will, record. In some institutions it's great, in some it's not. In some parts of the country it's great, in some cities it's not, depending where people go. And it costs you more to be able to do it because you need a competent interpreter. This, I was told, is a parietal meningioma. And to tell you the truth, I don't know much about ultrasound, but I cannot read it. Nuclear medicine, in spite of the first scan that you saw, suffers of the same problem. I have a one page from the doctor that gave me the scan as to what's wrong with this person, and I don't fully understand it, and I don't see it in the picture. As soon as you need that interpretation, as soon as you need that kind of technical know-how, the cost of implementing this technology will never go down, no matter what happens to the equipment itself. It's because of that that people try to improve the way that you can look at the body, the clarity, if you will. Here's an example of state-of-the-art nuclear medicine looking at a young woman's thyroid. They, there is a radioisotope that's been distributed. It's a little bit patchy, but she would have been sent home and told to come back a year later just to check her over again. We used a device very different, which never found commercial application because the people who made this device had a mature technology and they didn't see any sense in competing with themselves. And they were all rushing over themselves to be the second company in the field to introduce this kind of device. And as such, it never came to pass. But notice that the same thyroid shows some small nodules. And indeed, when she was operated, she had multiple uh, carcinomas, two to three millimeters in diameter. They were eradicated soon enough that I see her still on campus. It's interesting if you think of cost. It, we spent probably the better part of half a million dollars before we abandoned this project as having no future. This is the only person that it's ever helped, except the careers of a number of individuals. <laughs> <laughs> and the question that you have to ask is, was it worth it? Uh, I know that if we ask her and her children, that you're going to get an answer that may be very different from the systems analysis uh, answer that otherwise you would get. But this ended, but there's a better way of looking, but it ended in failure simply because the economics were not there, the incentives were not there. What people did try to do is use conventional instruments to get different views of the same kind of distribution of radioisotopes, and that's called tomography, doing cross sections that are easier to understand. And those instruments did not get better, but we have started now to use computers to sharpen up the images. And believe it or not, these are uh, basically the bones in the head, and uh, the important ones are the mandibular bones here, seen with a clarity that for nuclear medicine is unprecedented. What we have done here is substituted the, with software for the imperfections of the hardware and try to improve the outcome. The same has happened in positron tomography, which is a variant of nuclear medicine, where the IEEE, again, has been the home for, for these developments, or at least for the presentation of these developments, and the people who do it. This is something that was available in the early 70s, distributions of radioisotopes and a transmission image to see where they are. Because the isotopes are so specific that you don't know exactly where they are. They go to the organ you want, but you don't see the anatomic landmarks. And this is in the heart. And things have improved to the point that you now have a recognizable myocardial wall and blood pool here in red, as well as the outline. Now, the technology that came and seemed to be a, a godsend and a, and a cure was X-ray CT. But if you look at CT carefully, what is it? It's another way of displaying X-ray density information. It's no different from a film, except instead of giving you a projection of the body, it gives a slice. And it has the very same problem. 
First, CT started without uh, contrast media, without injection of agents. But what happened is they were using things like 40 and 80 rads of those. And that's a lot. That's getting to the point that you have to worry about. Now machines use maybe 100 to 500 millirads, certainly below a rad, which is nothing to worry about, but hundreds of grams of contrast media. Here is a patient that the neurologist, who doesn't have a union card for radiologists, called them normal right here. This is too low a density. Now, I would have never, working with them, I would have never thought of this, but the radiologist, surprise of his union card, said there is also something wrong here, and everybody left. Look at an NMR scan. I don't think you need a union card to tell that there is something very wrong in this person's head. There is blood that's accumulated on both sides and is compressing the brain. What is happening here is that with nuclear magnetic resonance, we truly are getting into a situation where we can start to provide more information and more easily interpretable information. And I'd like to go now very rapidly to give you a, a visual impact, a visual feel for what this technology does. The views of the body are unparalleled. You can see here the gallbladder. This is concentrated bile. The patient has eaten, and now there is diluted bile on top. There is the liver. Look at the kidneys, cortex and medulla. Vessels, which previously need something injected to be seen, I say like in CT, appear simply because moving blood has material that's different from stationary material. So there comes the vessels for free, the spleen. You can see the gut not very well because the imaging is relatively slow. Views of the spine with the nerves coming out, again, only seen in anatomy books previously. The base of the brain with a pituitary gland, a detail that to a certain degree exceeds what you see in anatomy books, and views that are not previously available. The slices not only come across, but come from the front or from the side. Here's a person. It, it took very little time to put this technology to use once it was developed. Here's a person that years ago had a myelogram. A myelogram is when they put a needle through your spine and inject contrast media, and it hurts. I have heard people have it, and they don't sound very nicely. This person lay down for 20 minutes to have a scan, you can see here the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, and you can see four discs intruding into it. This is information from pain, which is diffuse, to factual. Four discs. If you are going to do something, you have to do it in four places. It's the kind of information that's needed to take care of people, and it's obtained in a, in a comfortable, dignified, painless, and safe way. In NMR, it's just as easy to hide disease by doing the wrong thing as, as it is to pick it up. This slice, exactly the same slice as in the same patient, done a few minutes apart from each other, and it doesn't take much to know that there is something very wrong, and whatever is wrong is very subtle here. That's one of the problems with NMR, and we're going to need computers to take care of that, because we cannot count on people learning to use it and being able to have it uh, distributed throughout the population with the same amount of competence. Here's a way of highlighting disease. Five, different, six, five or six different ways, same section of the patient, each one showing these infections due to tox, uh, toxoplasmosis. Uh, this is what you get from cats if your immune system is down. And notice how we, how we have changed the, the ability to see it, brought it out uh, and uh, characterized it, for instance, the centering here. And we are also learning to calculate these images. We may not have to obtain all of those images. This is a calculated and this is obtained image. This calculated image was done with one fifty of the amount of data accumulation that took to obtain this one. So we're learning quite a bit as to how to minimize the front end, the expensive end of the device, minimize its utilization. The different views are allowing us to look now at the invasion of, of the bladder wall, for instance, by prostatic carcinoma. Very important in making decisions as to who to treat and when, how to treat them. And it's bringing up the possibility of screening for prostatic carcinoma. Now, who's going to pay for the screening and who is going to have it? I know I will, but the question is, 
we now need a policy because we can no longer say that the screening in itself carries a hazard. So it's no longer cost benefit, but we're now talking as to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, risk benefit. We're now talking to cost benefit, which is very different. And we're learning to characterize those tissues. So a computer can make a map of the tissues from the original images, color code the tissues so we can tell what we're looking at. <clears throat> Another example where screening can come in, because it's so easy to see vessels, we can tell if there is something wrong with the vessel. This aorta is obviously changing in shape, and it has some deposits in here. This person has a large aortic aneurysm with a great deal of deposits. Previously, it would have taken an a, a catheter, it would have taken an injection of contrast media, and you wouldn't have thought of screening for a disease like that. But now you can, and the question is, how are we going to do it? I don't think that we should be asking, should we? <clears throat> and to interpret those, instead of looking at those individual sections and trying to put them together, a computer can do this. And you can see here an aorta with severe narrowings. This has been color-coded for depth ballooning in this section and ballooning in this section. This is all done non-invasively in 20 minutes of imaging simply by lying on a table. And notice in here, <coughs> we are seeing a, side view, a front view of an aneurysm or a dissection of the aorta that's coming around and going literally around this patient. And we're coding it with different kinds of information. For instance, how fast is the blood flowing in different sections or how much of a channel is there open to flow. So all of this is information, and this information allows to make better decisions as to what to do uh, with people, and hopefully to detect these things. Incidentally, the, the atheroma, or if you will, the, the problem, the, the deposits are seen also in here, which you cannot see in an angiogram. In this case, they're coded in orange and up here in green. So we have a complete picture of what's going on in this vessel, where the deposits are, where the flow is, and one can treat now based on this kind of information. What is going to happen with this kind of technology is hard to tell, but there is no question in my mind that technology that's going to be the only way that's going to allow us to have a healthcare system that addresses the need, the perceived and the real needs of people, and at the same time that we're going to be able to afford it. Thank you. I'm sure that you all join me in thanking not only the panelists that have just completed their presentation, but all of those who have spoken this afternoon. The time of adjournment having arrived, I'm going to now say that we are through with this session and hope that we will see most of you back here in an hour. Good day. Thank you very much indeed. Let's go give him a hard time. Yes, give him a hard time.